Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, the doors are now being locked. You can no longer escape. Um, and I'm really glad you've all come to learn about the best way to use punishment to motivate your teams. Fantastic, fantastic stuff. So I actually wanted to call this blame-driven development, but apparently BDD is already being used. Who knew? So this is PDD. But given that BDD stole something from me, I'm stealing something from them. So here's an example of our punishment-driven development. Given that a team isn't delivering fast enough, when you have told them the delivery date time and time again, then punish them with no bonus and bad performance reviews. This is my suggestion for the real way to get there. They won't do it again. Oh, coming late into a punishment type scenario is not a good move. Yeah. Okay, so uh, one organization that I joined had an, a tale about a previous CIO that had been there, who apparently, whenever anything went wrong in live, would stand behind the person who was trying to sort the issue out and shout at them until it was fixed. Apparently, this was a really good motivating way of, of getting them to do it. Um, I also have another boss who, the minute that anything was wrong, would exactly ask this question, who's to blame, would come straight out of her mouth. And uh, to which my response would be, it doesn't really matter who's to blame. What matters is what we're going to learn and what we're not going to do again. And to give her her credit, she would go, oh, yes, you're right, that's fine. But this was still the very first question that would come out of her mouth each time. Now, I have a challenge for you. I should have warned you this is very interactive. You guys are not going to just get to sit there, because otherwise I'll have to do more work, so we don't do that. So I need one volunteer from each side. No, it's not looking good. There we go. You see, this side is now winning, I'm just saying. <laughs> We need a volunteer. There you go. Come on, then. So we have the winning team and the losing team at the moment. Come up, come up. So, <laughs> not too much encouragement, please. It'll go to their heads. So, so here's yours and here's yours. Your challenge is for everybody on your side, you need to make sure they have exactly one of those. No more than one. No less than one. And all of the spare ones are back with me. Okay, go. Faster than this. This is a competition, you know. I have to say, neither side is really showing very much enthusiasm on this at the moment. Mm. Oh, just kind of getting there. Thank you. So does everybody on this side have one? Hold it up so I can see. I don't think it's quite true, though, is it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do you have one? Common mistake. Thank you. You can sit down now. I have to say that wasn't the most competitive of uh, competitions I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Too much exercise. Rather, it's not the competition side. It's just the like the effort. I admit, this is just before lunch, which is quite a good time to do some punishment, I think, keep you from lunch for as long as possible. So, we're now going to do an experiment. So, this is why you have the cards. I'm going to tell you that there are five uh, stages of this experiment that we're going to go through, but you're not going to know why we're doing it until the end. My husband says I have to tell people that because he, uh, he's very much uh, needs to know exactly how many and what's going to go on and where things are at, so... For anyone of you, of his ilk, out in the audience, there will be five. So, this experiment, um, what you need to do is show me the green side of your card if you think that the answer to the question I'm asking you is low. And the red side if you think the answer is high. We'll go through, you'll see what I mean. Here's the first part of the experiment. John is at a football game when he sees another fan wearing a scarf that he just shouldn't be wearing. It's, it's quite reasonable. So he, he gives him a chance. He asks him to take the scarf off. I mean, that, that's very kind, really. You know, he could have just... But he refused. So John hit him. So I have two questions for you after each one of these scenarios we're going to do. The first one is, how blameworthy is John? So this is where you use your cards. If you think he's very much to blame for this, you'd show me the red card that's high. 
If you think he's not very much to blame, you show me the green card, which is low. Okay, so, oh. so generally, this side, the winning side, I'm just saying, think he's very much to blame. And generally, the losing side think he's not that much to blame on, on, as a whole. Not everybody, but as a whole. All right. Um, I asked, in order to get some obviously very representative uh, answers on these questions, I asked my Facebook friends all of these questions. And uh, they filled in a little form for me. They were able to do things a little bit more uh, at a detailed level than you guys, so they were able to give a one to nine answer for each of those questions. So one was not very, and nine was very, and they were able to do a little in the middle. And here's their results. So um, you can see generally a lot of people thought that he was very to blame, but that he didn't deserve that much punishment. Okay? Now, we do have one person up there who thought he was very to blame, and I think the score there was um, about seven out of nine for punishment. So I think this guy's probably in prison for 20 years for doing this. And there's one person who obviously does this every weekend. So uh, I, I'm, I made one big mistake with doing this survey that I just put out there and asked my friends on Facebook to fill in. Is It was anonymous, and I actually don't know who these people were who gave these answers. So it it's actually gets a little worrying as we go on. Okay. So there are lots of forms of punishment in the workplace. And so the one that I started with is the one that most people think of. It's the manager punishing people for not doing what the managers decided should be done. But actually, we talk a lot in Agile around things like bonuses, etc. This was a really interesting example. I was speaking to a product owner at a conference. And we were all having a conversation about how can you use bonuses to really motivate people? You know, what should we be doing in the agile world around this? And he had this great answer that he did with his team, which is that uh, he, he gives them the bonus. As a product owner, he's actually in charge of the bonus in their area. And he gives them a bonus which is inversely proportional to the number of bugs he finds in UAT. So the more bugs in UAT, the lower your bonus. And he thought this was great and that this was what he was suggesting through. So I have an imaginary team for him. So uh, we'll start off there with Albert. So Albert is a new graduate. He's not worked in industry before. So his software's okay, but he, he doesn't really know how to write uh, robust software that's going to stand the test of time and is maintainable and all those things. And um, so he needs a lot of help from other people. They're, he's just been there a couple of weeks. He's still coming on board. So what do you think this bonus scheme is going to do to his output? It's interactive. You, oh, red. Well, <laughs> not good. Not good. Do you, does everyone agree? At best it's going to make no difference to his output because he can't improve his quality at this point. It's not a cho choice that he's making. Um, and at worst, it worries him and he actually ends up doing less well. So then we have Betty. Now, Betty at the moment is actually, um, uh, she has some really big issues in her personal life and she's not able to be as mentally there at work as she ordinarily would be. So what difference is this bonus scheme going to make to Betty? Zero? We'll give extra stress. Yeah. So at best, it would have no effect. And at worst, it might make it worse and she might go off with stress for a while. Yeah. And then we have Charlie. Charlie's just plain lazy. So he's going to do the absolute minimum that he can do. Um, so actually, he's probably the one that this type of bonus scheme was designed for. So what effect do we think this bonus scheme will have on Charlie? He'll no code, no bugs. Absolutely. So he's also clever. He's lazy, so it's designed for him, but he's too clever to fall for it. Both of you got that. Um, and he just won't write anything, and then he gets his full bonus because he hasn't got any issues in UAT. Um, and then we have Doris. So Doris is actually uh, really good at what she does. She prides herself on the quality code that she writes. Um, and she helps all the other team members, brings them along, builds their skills. So what impact is this bonus scheme going to have on Doris? She'll change her focus. In what way? Stop helping. That's a possibility, isn't it? Focus on her own code. Any other thoughts? She'll quit, yeah. 
quite possibly. So, uh, you know, I think she would probably find it highly offensive that this type of bonus scheme is going in when she already prides herself on the quality of the code that she writes. And there's a distinct possibility that she'll stop supporting the others if, if it were to work for her in some way. So all in all, this bonus scheme to me is a form of punishment. It's an assumption that you're lazy and you're only not delivering quality because of your laziness. And um, its motivation is uh, questionable. So why do we punish people? Do none of you ever punish anyone? So they don't do it again. That's one reason. Any other reasons we might punish people? So that you feel better. <laughs> to assert authority, yeah. Ah, so it's kind of an ongoing behavior. We were punished before, so now we punish. Anything else? Ah, because we might be expected to punish other people. Okay. So uh, the literature says there are four reasons that we punish. So this is general rather than necessarily software world. So to put people off from doing the same thing, to stop that person from doing the same thing, for retribution, because it feels good, and um, to compensate the victim. So obviously, uh, generally not in the software world, the last one. Um, so I think often when you see punishment in the software world, we claim it's for one of the first two reasons, but it's really for retribution because it feels good. They've done something bad and we've told them and that feels good. It's nearly always about the person who's doing the punishing more than it is really about the people being punished. So scenario two. So uh, John and Steve made it up. They're, they're good friends now. So they go out hunting. Um, so John followed all the safety rules, but his gun misfires, and he accidentally killed Steve. Now, this wasn't deliberate. I know he punched him in the face before, but that was all over with. This was not deliberate. Okay. So how blameworthy is John? So red side if you think he's highly blameworthy, and green side if you think he's not. Okay. So we have a bit of a mixture, probably mainly green, but there's a really big smattering of red there. Um, okay, and how much punishment does John deserve? High is red, green is low. Okay, so generally, lower level of punishment, although I have to say the winning team was a little more on the uh, punishment side than the uh, losing team was. Um, so my Facebook friends, um, generally, you can see the majority of them, it, it's quite linear this, isn't it? The majority of them were down at that not too blameworthy, shouldn't have too much punishment. Uh, the one that's right at the top there, I know who that one was because he contacted me afterwards on Facebook and went, this question's wrong. And, uh, and said, you know, you shouldn't be pointing your gun at somebody if you, and that's part of the safety rules, etc. So he had extra information which led him down that route. Um, but generally, people felt, you know, it was an accident. He didn't mean to do it, even though the consequences were high. Okay. I joined one organization where there was a team where one of the developers in the team was ostracized. No one liked him. No one wanted to work with him. He, they would have meetings, chat about what it was they wanted to do. He was much slower on the uptake in those meetings than the other developers were. He kept asking really stupid, basic questions until they just had to stop him doing it so they could get on with their work. And he also never would stick to any decisions that they made in the meeting, even though he was part of making those decisions. And no one wanted to work with him. No one made it. You know, everyone knew. He knew. Nobody respected him in any way at all. Um, and I asked the team to do two things for me. The first one was to let him ask his questions, not to stop him. What they actually found was around a third of the time, he found fundamental issues in the way that they were going to do something by asking those basic questions. And they started to see that there was actually some value in letting him do that. And the second thing I asked them to do was to actually, when they made a decision in a meeting, just send a quick email afterwards, just a one sentence email saying, we agreed to do X. And then he stuck to each and every single decision that was made. Because for some people, a verbal decision doesn't feel very real. 
and that's where he was at. It just didn't feel very real to him. So although he was part of that, he didn't really feel my husband's like that, which is probably why I picked up that maybe we could try this. I don't email him with our decisions. But he's... <laughs> um, but he, uh, yeah, I slack channel him to say, you're doing this, you said you would. Um, <laughs> but the... Uh, so he started to be valued within the team. He was adding something that no other person in that team was adding. He was bringing something very different to that group. And actually, we see that a lot. Where I see a team which is really close knit except for one person, that person probably could really add value. It's just that they are not like the other people in that team. That neurodiversity, that willingness to stand back and accept someone's not like me, but what they're bringing may be more valuable than I do in that one area. You know, let's, let's actually experiment with that. Um, we play a special game of that in my organization called Blame the BA. Um, yeah, just thought I'd mention that. Okay, so next part of the experiment, scenario three. Did someone just come in, by the way? Oh, shocking. Come get your card. You get a red card. Did you come in as well? You see, someone snuck in. I didn't notice. Now I'm failing in my punishmentness. That's a technical term, in case any of you were wondering. You're welcome. So, scenario three. Uh, Steve has recovered from his death, and um, but he's not very happy with John. Okay, so he decides John. John actually is a driver of a security van with lots of money in it, um, and Steve kidnaps John's daughter, and he says if he doesn't give him the money then he's, you know, he's going to kill her. Now, he's not very happy. To be fair, we have to allow that for Steve. He's, he's not a happy man. You know, he's been punched in the face, and then he was dead. So, um, and John gives Steve the money and gets his daughter back. So, John has committed a crime here. So, what we're looking at is John, not Steve, but John. So, how blameworthy is John for stealing the money? So show me the green side if you think that he is not very blameworthy and the red side if you think he is blameworthy. Okay, so we're mainly green with some smattering reds. And um, how much punishment does he deserve? Green for low, red for high. Okay, we've got a very tough man at the back there. But generally, generally we're thinking he's not needing that much punishment. So here are my Facebook friends again, and mostly they agree with you. Uh, there are some hardliners amongst my Facebook friends, apparently. Um, you, you should make friends with them. I'm not sure exactly which one. That, you're not my Facebook friend, are you? I'm just checking. No. <laughs> um, okay. So another form of punishment. This is when we blame ourselves. Um, my most recent example of this is, is one of the developers who went on to live thinking they were on test. And uh, they submitted something that would have gotten somebody a new mortgage um, offer. And luckily, they realized the second they pushed that button that that's what they had done. And we rushed around and stopped it from actually happening. So there was no customer impact. But this guy was so down on himself and just kept putting himself down all the time for doing it. He gave himself a big note, which is still on his desk to this day, which says, do not go on live. I'm not sure how that's meant to help. Um, so we tried a lot of things. We spoke to him about um, all the terrible things we had ever done, of which there were lots. It was, it was quite an amusing story time, actually. Um, we also, um, you know, sort of said, well, actually, what can we learn from this? So we had a situation where live looked like test. Why have we got that? This is a really good learning point. Let's actually change that so live, test, dev, just have completely different color schemes so that we can't do this again. Also, um, you know, there are other reasons and other things in there. So how come he could log into live using the same credentials that he used in test? So there's all sorts of lessons here and things to learn. Um, but actually, self-punishment is one of the things that we do that really isn't helpful and really doesn't push forward. Okay. Um, because I'm really into Agile and Lean, we have to have some Japanese words because apparently it's the law. So Hansai is about knowing yourself, looking at yourself and what you do. 
um, and actually spending that time to try and understand why you behave the way you behave and looking at what you can do about that, particularly in this talk with regards to punishment. So here's an example of one of those. I worked at one organization where Yes But Man worked. So uh, for my sins at that time, I was doing project management. I'm glad to say I, I left that life far behind. And um, he was the team lead of one of the teams there, the development teams. And he had been there a really long time. It was like 20, 25 years there. He was safe. He had a good job. They all respected him. And he would just say yes. So mainly I worked with a different team, but there were just some bits and pieces that I would need from his team occasionally to, to help my team work through. And he would just say yes. He would just say, yes, we can do that. Yes, that date's fine. And whenever we got to that date, it was not there. Something more important had come up. So I started to check in with him earlier and more regularly. Is it still going to be okay? Is it still going to be okay? And he's like, yes, yeah, stop asking me. It's absolutely fine. No problem at all. And yet every single time, it wasn't there when I needed it to be there. And I tried everything with this guy, all the tricks in the book. So I tried being nice and friendly and kind of getting to know him a bit. He wasn't really very interested. I tried to get to know his team to see if I could kind of get in underneath. I even went to the extent of buying the Marks and Spencer's chocolate biscuits, which is the extreme. They normally only come out as the thank you afterwards with things, but, you know, they were on offer. But nonetheless, it was, it was a big thing to do. Um, still didn't work. Made no difference at all. And I've never been in a situation where the Marks and Spencer's chocolate biscuit bit fails. So it, it was very hard. Um, and what I ended up doing, I was, I was desperate at this point, so I'm just experimenting, trying different things. And what I ended up doing that worked was effectively saying to him, oh, I'm a bit ditzy, you're amazing, you know all this stuff, I'm a bit stupid, I should have asked you before, could you help me out, because, hey, I'm a bit ditzy, um, and, you know, get this done for me. And that brought out his, it, it fed his arrogant side, and so he was able to feel superior, and then he would do it, and he delivered each and every single time. And I'm sitting there saying these things, not exactly that, obviously, thinking in my head, you sad, sad man. But it worked. Did it solve the problem for everyone else? No. Did it solve the problem of his behavior? No. But that wasn't my role there. That wasn't my job there. I was uh, contracting. I was a temporary member of staff. He was a permanent member of staff. It wasn't my job to actually solve this issue as a personnel issue. It was my job to deliver my projects. And I got that, and I did that. So I guess that's where I'm, I'm coming from in the thinking, standing back, taking your own emotion out of it. So I use the fact that I feel that strong emotion in the workplace. I actually use that as a signal to say, right, it's time to stand back and actually look at what do I want out of this. So what I wanted out of this situation was to be able to... Um, to get my stuff delivered. I didn't actually care about anything else. What I wanted was to get my stuff delivered. And then I tried lots of ways to try and get there. Um, I, I also try and do that in my personal life. So uh, my poor husband, um, we got in my car. It was a good few months ago now. Um, and I was driving my car, but he had driven my car the day before. And he'd adjusted the seat and everything. I mean, it's just shocking behavior. And uh, so I got in and I had to adjust it. And I just felt that irritation. And the minute I felt that, I just stood back mentally and said, is this reasonable? And I went, no, that's just stupid. Of course it's not reasonable. I wanted him to drive my car. So he was driving me the day before. It wasn't like he had just randomly driven my car. Um, and so I didn't say anything. And I was able to just completely let go of that irritation straight away because I went, oh, it's not reasonable. Um, so I try and do that in the workplace also. Um, right, scenario four. So you've been feeling a little sorry for John recently. but um, So he planned to kill his mother for the inheritance. So he dragged her to the bed, lit her oxygen mask with his cigarette to make it look like an accident, and she burnt to death. So, how blameworthy is John for this? I thought you were going to give me a green then. You kind of pretended it was accidental and turned it around, didn't you? 
and how much punishment does he deserve? I think we're pretty unanimous on red, red there. Um, mostly my, my Facebook friends agree with you. I am a little worried. I haven't gone on Facebook very much since I did this poll. I'm kind of thinking I might just sort of slowly step back from all my friends on Facebook. Um, but yes, uh, mostly they agree. Okay, angry man. So I joined one organization, and in my first week there, I had somebody uh, come to me and say, you know, I've got this thing I need your team to do for me. We've been having a bit of a talk about it, but you've just started. So, you know, can you talk to them and come to me with a proposal? So I had a bit of a chat to my team. A few days later, he'd organized a meeting. There are about 10 of us in there. And we start to tell him, or I start to tell him, about the ideas we've had of what we might do to solve his problem. And he just started to get really angry. And I didn't know why. He was having to control his voice. It was a very tight, he was having to, he was doing things with his hands. He was controlling it. He wasn't shouting, he wasn't throwing things, he wasn't doing any of those things. But he was very, very angry. And I'm sitting there going, I don't know what I've done to this guy. I'm actually just, I'm not even saying anything contentious. I'm not saying anything that I can imagine could possibly upset anybody. And I had no idea to, what to do. So I just continued as if this wasn't happening. I just continued the meeting. And uh, at one point, he said he had to go and he left. Now, bear in mind, I was brand new to this organization. So I didn't know the other people in the room very well at all. And I sort of turned around to them and said, can any of you tell me what that was about? And they said no. And I was like, oh, well, at least it wasn't anything obviously stupid. Um, so, you know... I, and I was sitting there and I was trying to mull. So this meeting was first thing in the day. And I was just sitting there trying to mull. What do I do about this? I mean, I had all sorts of emotions that came out the back of that. Um, it's quite unacceptable to treat somebody that way. Uh, particularly somebody very new to the organization, but unacceptable anyway. Also, I'm quite internally referenced, so I don't really mind what other people think of me because I know I'm good. Which is great for me, not so good for my manager. Um, but... Um, so, you know, so for me, it was okay because I'm very internally referenced. But he didn't know me. He didn't know I was internally referenced. I could have been very externally referenced, and that could have really affected me and really upset me. And so I had a lot of emotions around this and the unacceptability of, of what happened. Um, but as I say, I use that as a signal to myself to stand back and say, what do I actually want here? Because I find when I just react out of those things, I always regret it. It's never the best solution that I could have gotten for my situation. So I stood back and I said, what do I want? And the answer for me was, what I wanted was a good working relationship with this guy. Actually, the fact that this had happened wasn't the important thing. The important thing was, how do we work together going forward? Um, so I was ready to experiment again. It's, it's uh, kind of like lean startup applied to people. And um, so I, I was ready to experiment, but actually the first thing I tried worked, which was quite a shock to me. Um, what I was thinking about was why did he behave that way? I couldn't see anything I'd done to do it. So I came up with a theory that maybe he was unhappy with other things that had been going on in his life. So maybe there was something at home, maybe there was something like that. And even if I went up to him and said, let's have a conversation about this, it would probably still be very emotional, very fraught, very difficult. And in a way, I'm saying, justify your behavior to me. That's a form of punishment as well. When I'm saying, oh, I'm being perfectly reasonable and talking about it afterwards, I'm actually making you justify the fact you behaved that way to me. So what I actually did was went up to him and said, I have no idea what I did that upset you this morning, but whatever it is, I'm really sorry. And he smiled, and that was it. It's really unsatisfying because I still don't know to this day what I did that upset him. But it worked. I got a good relationship with him. We carried on. It was important to me that he knew that I didn't know what I'd done. So if I did the same thing again, it wasn't like complete Armageddon. Um, but, you know, to me, that was an opening gambit. And then maybe that might lead on to the conversation if he wanted to talk about it. But the main thing for me was I gave him a get-out clause. I gave him his dignity, and that led us to uh, a good working relationship subsequently. Um, so this is the last Japanese word, I promise. Um, so when we talk about continuous improvement, 
of processes, etc. I like to apply that from the, to the people side as well. So this is about applying that to yourself. How did that go? Could that have gone better? Could you have gotten a better answer out of that? Could you have worked with that person better? Could you have left them feeling better and you feeling better at the end of that particular interaction? Actually just applying that analytical thinking, which anybody who works in the software industry has and is able to do, to your own behavior and to your interactions with other people. The last part of the experiment. So... Uh, John managed to get away with killing his mother. No one found him, so he's fine. He's around. Uh, Steve's still alive. Um, we've, uh, so they're friends now. They've gotten over all of this murder and death and, and punching and things. So they're good friends now. But they are a bit competitive with each other. They like to play tennis. Um, and they're out there playing tennis. And, you know, Steve's easily winning today. Normally they're pretty well matched, but, you know, he's easily winning today. And... Um, and John's getting a bit frustrated about this. So he hits the ball really hard. Um, it goes and it hits Steve in the eye, gives him a black eye. So how blameworthy is John for this behavior? Oh, we've got some competitive people in the room. Not very blameworthy at all, a lot of you. So about half and half that. Interesting. Um, and uh, how much punishment does he deserve? Oh, oh, you're a bit mean. That's like 10 years in prison or something. <laughs> so let's see what my strange Facebook friends said. So uh, we do have generally different levels of, of blameworthiness felt, but generally low level. There was someone who agreed with you. It's kind of like 10 to 20 years in prison here. You're not my Facebook friend either, are you? I'm just, I'm still trying to work out who these people are. And, uh, yeah, so why have we been doing all of these questions? Um, there was an experiment that was done in, uh, um, published in 2015, which was looking at why do we blame people? How much do we blame people? Are there areas of our brain which affects that? Um, and they were looking particularly at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And what they did, they put um, a magnetic coil on people's heads and they asked them the types of questions that I've been asking you. These are stolen from their particular study. They have a lot more than these. And sometimes that coil was turned on and sometimes it wasn't. And when it was turned on, it dampened the behavior in that part of the brain. So it just dampened it down. And when it was turned off, it had no effect at all. And the person who was sitting there, there was no sign for them as to whether it was on or whether it was off. And they asked them a lot of these types of questions. And what they found was that how blameworthy somebody thought John was, was consistent for that person. Now, everybody has their own values and their own views on the world. But they had enough different questions of similarity of different scopes and different areas to be able to tell that no matter whether the, the coil was on or off, the level of blame that somebody thought somebody had was the same. But the amount they wanted to punish them was less. If the coil was on, they wanted to punish them at a lower level than if the coil was off. So there's definitely something in this part of the brain that makes us want to punish people. So it's not about how much blame do they deserve. So it's quite an interesting study. And actually, in many ways, gives me hope. Because if that's purely a function of my brain feels like punishing people at the moment, well, that's something I can overcome. That's something I can choose whether to do or not to do. This isn't something that's inherent and has to happen. I also think it, it gives us the chance to maybe install some new equipment in offices across the land. And um, so I think what this leads us to is we have the Punishment Driven Development Manifesto. I like to steal things from everywhere. So finding out who is to blame over working collaboratively. Retribution over encouraging innovation. Punishing mistakes over avoiding future mistakes and venting emotions over achieving goals. And we all choose sometimes to do the things on the left-hand side rather than the things on the right-hand side. But I would prefer to change this into the people-driven development manifesto. Respecting people over controlling people. 
celebrating mistakes over punishing mistakes. So I don't mean go out and go, yeah, hey, we made a mistake, but actually seeing it as a positive thing that we now know that problem exists. Putting yourself in their place rather than putting others in their place. Changing your behavior over changing their behavior. You cannot choose to change someone else's behavior, but you can always choose to change your own. So we have the people-driven development rather than punishment-driven development, PDD. Um, and that's been me, and that's everything. Thank you. So we have time for questions, if anyone's got any. No? So the question for anyone who didn't quite hear that was, when you work with the Dark Lord, what can you do about it? No, <laughs> it was slightly more than that. Um, so, I th you know, my view is, so you look at that from your own emotional point of view. When you're being blamed for something, whether you're, you should be blamed for it or not, it should be irrelevant. You're going to have an emotional response to that when you're blamed for something. Um, and I think the main thing to do is to use that to stand back and to ask yourself, what can I do in this situation? I've got somebody, they're coming, they're blaming the team. It's not the team's fault. Um, what can I do about that? And your solution to that was to be confrontational to him. Um, and that worked for about two months each time. And it may be for him, that's the right answer. Um, and in none of this am I saying, his theory, go and apply it. What I'm saying is, do that stand back. Think about that person what do you want out of that? What is the primary thing that you want? So if what you're wanting is for him not to blame you, or for him not to demotivate the team, or for him not to be saying that to higher level management. So you need to pick which one of those is the most important thing to you. And then theorize, and you can do it as a team if the whole team's being blamed, and look at how might we achieve that one thing. So if it's that we don't want him to come and blame us, we don't want to have that conversation, uh, we don't want to be demotivated when that happens, well, we have two choices there. We either stop him doing it or we stop him demotivating us when he does it. And then there's different approaches to what we would do in order to achieve that. Uh, if it's that we don't want him talking to high-level management and blaming us, well, we start our own conversations with management about where things are and making sure they're up to date with things. So... It just depends what that main thing is you want. And when something doesn't work, you try the next thing. So it sounds like you came up with a coping mechanism of not letting him get away with it, and that that actually worked reasonably well. It was just a repeated one. So then you have the question of, do, do I want to experiment and find others, or am I happy every two months to tell him to sort his life out? <laughs> yeah, he might walk out of my talk, I think. Any other thoughts? How would you motivate the lazy person? We're going, coming slightly off of topic, but that's fine. I'm always happy to talk about anything. The, uh, so I'm a great believer. You know, you've got theory X, theory Y stuff. I'm a huge believer that people want to make a difference at work. They don't get up and go in because they've got nothing better to do. Um, and I think they want to make a difference. And if you allow them to make a difference, people are happy. So where you get somebody who is lazy, who's coming in nine to five, does the least that they can do when they go in, my first question is why? What has happened in their work life that that's where they're at? 
Do they just not enjoy this as a job? Is this just not something that, do they not enjoy the creativity side of their coding? Or, you know, what is that? Um, or have they just been slapped down every time they've come up with ideas for change? Have they just been ignored whenever they've tried to make any changes, tried to make a difference, and just put back in their box so often that now they're like, whatever, just pay me to come in and I'll come in. Um, so for me, in that scenario, it's much more about trying to get inside their head and understand from them why they're in that place, why they feel that way. Yeah. So is it... Yeah. Okay. So I guess that talk is... So if we look back at Odd Man Out... There was an assumption in their team that the problem was with him and that it was him that needed to be fixed, whereas actually the problem was with the team. But there was, there was an accepted thing that the problem was with him. So in, conv in talking to somebody who is that nine-to-five person, if your assumption is the problem is with them, that type of, I would expect that type of thing where they go, okay, I'll sort of do some other bits, but as soon as it sort of goes off a bit, I'll just go back to where I was. So, is the problem in the system? Is the problem in the way that he's being managed? Is it the problem in the way he's been managed in the past? And, and that's just pushed him down a certain route. So, what does excite him about his job? What if he could do, would he really enjoy? And could you give him a little bit of that? Whenever you have something like that, maybe he could do that bit. And then he'd enjoy it, and then he'd be in a different place with his job. I'm not saying the answers to the questions are easy, because they're not. Another example that's similar to that is, is like when you've got a member of the team that's very arrogant. So it's, it's the same thing. You know, you've got someone who knows everything, whether they do or they don't. Um, and again, I would ask in that scenario, why are they like that? Why do they need everybody to know that they're the top person? And it doesn't really matter whether they are the top person or they're not the top person. What is it? Why are they needing that? And address that rather than blame them for their behavior. Because the minute you start with the blame is with them, that conversation is not going to get to the root issue. I'm not saying it's always solvable either, because it isn't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the question being, as a manager, is it actually worthwhile spending time uh, trying to sort out the people issues rather than just hire someone else in? Yeah. Um, I would say yes. As, as a deeply uh, committed developer most of my life uh, that has been uh, somehow gone into the management route, um, I like to view people as an incredibly complex code. They need debugging. It's, it's the most amazing problem solving you will ever do is working with people and trying to work out how to make them happy. Because at the end of the day, that's what I'm trying to do. Because happy people will do their job well. And I care that they're happy as well. But, um, and so for me, the challenge is fantastic. So yeah, I could go and buy another module off the shelf, which may not have this problem, but it might have a different bug in it that I'm not aware of at the moment. And then I've got to work out what that bug is. Whereas actually I know what this problem is and I can get into it and I can understand it. And through doing that, I understand people better. I understand that person better. I can make them happier. That's hugely satisfying for me. I've solved that. I haven't solved the problem, but I've helped in that problem. So that whole problem solving approach, I think, can absolutely be applied to management and people to great success. Um, is it worth doing it? I get a huge buzz out of where you have someone in, in exactly the scenario that you were talking about where they are demotivated and you can turn them around and into somebody who loves their job. Even if their productivity stayed exactly the same, I get a huge out, amount out of having done that. Um, having solved that issue. I also love it when I'm doing things, and I will always try and predict every person is different, every individual is different. And when you're introducing change or you're bringing things through, everybody's going to react differently. 
And if you are a manager, or even if you're not, but you, everybody works with other people, um, you need to try and look at it from their point of view, for that individual, for that person, not how would I feel if I was in that situation. That's just a starting place. But actually, how would they feel, given what I know about them, how did they feel in that situation? And um, so I do that a lot. And I made a change uh, in my organization a while ago. And I had a really interesting experience where most people accepted it, and that was my prediction of what they would do. Um, and I predicted one person was going to have a huge problem with it. And I sat down with her and talked about it, and she went, OK, fine. I was just like, that's really interesting. I'm learning more about her now. Because that is not how I expected to react, given what had happened before. So let's think that one through. And another person who I thought would have no problem with it at all was really unhappy. And that was also really interesting to me. Um, because it means I've gotten to know him a little better now than I did before, and I can predict him a little better later. So I view investing in people, investing in my knowledge of them, and investing in their job satisfaction, and investing in their empowerment, and investing in them being able to make as much of a difference as they want to make at work, is incredibly personally satisfying and also financially for the organization a really good investment to make. So, so the question there is, if they're actively disenchanted after six months, nothing you can do, you've got to manage them out. I've never actually quite been in that situation. Um, I have been in a situation where the person was not capable of doing the job. So a, a very different one. He really, really wanted to do it, but his brain didn't work in the right way. It's been quite a long time since I've sat. They've let me near live code. Um, but you know, even I was telling him how to solve his problems in a technology that wasn't my main technology set when I did program every day. Um, and he couldn't follow the logic. And we did have to manage him out. And that was not that was not about a lack of attitude. He really wanted to do it, and he put in lots of extra hours, but he just was not capable of thinking in that way. Um, I've never actually had to manage somebody out from an attitude point of view. But having said that, now I'm going to be faced with something. I know that as soon as I get back to work, I'm going to have one of those situations. So I'm not saying it will never happen. Just because you're putting all that effort in and trying to work it through doesn't mean it's solvable necessarily. That person might be so far down the track of that, that it's never going to change. But I just have this huge uh, belief in people that you put up walls. If, if you're a nine-to-fiver, it's because you've been beaten down. You've been beaten into that you're going in. It's a protection thing. If you can show them they don't need that protection anymore and give them chances and give them things and slowly encourage them out, I'm a, I'm a huge believer it's doable. But you do get the question from over there is how much of that effort is worth it when you've got the whole of everybody else as well. So that's, that's got to be a personal decision. It's got to be how much else is on my plate, etc. But I personally would always do that investment. Any other thoughts from anybody? Sorry, I didn't hear you. What if a team works better if they have an external person to blame? Is that what you were saying? OK. Um, still not the most positive scenario, though, is it? <laughs> um, now, I, I, I put up a slide joking about blame the BA. When, when I started up my organization, it's absolutely where we were. Very functionally split, very functionally managerially split. And everything was, well, they didn't write the spec. It was all waterfall when I joined. It wasn't in the spec. It's their fault. And you kind of say, well, when you, when you read the spec, was it clear that there was something missing here? That's not the point. You know, so that comfort in being able to blame somebody else really is covering up, to some extent, behaviors that we could have that actually would help that problem. Um, and the more that we can be collaborative, the more that... So y you need to accept the edges. When... Um, I worked um, at one point in a sort of long-term consultancy writing software for another organization, but for many years rather than kind of go in and tell them what to do and leave again. And, uh, and often my boss at that organization, I would work remotely, but there would be someone there that was running it. They might not 
be great in one area. So maybe they are really good with the budget, but they don't actually schedule anything. So my view there is, well, I'll step in and do that. So whatever bits it is, if they do everything great, that's fine. I'll just get on with my other work. But if they don't, I'll just fill in. I'll just do those bits in between. Um, and we'll get to where we need to be. And it doesn't really matter whether that was my job or it wasn't my job or someone else should have done it. I think um, in software, we get, a very, we get a lot of black and white thinkers. And, and I do hear from some, one of my guys, quite often he'll say, well, they should have done that. And, and my response is, you're absolutely right. That job role, they should have covered that. But you knew they didn't cover it last time. And you could have bobbed upstairs and had a chat with the guys and we wouldn't have had this issue. So you know to go and fill in for that. So there's no point blaming. They're trying to do their best job as well. It's just their view of their job is different from yours. <laughs> yes. Yes, so the question was, have I ever been in a blame culture type organization and, and had to move it? So whilst it wasn't quite as extreme as the whole organization was blame culture, when I joined my current organization, it was strongly influenced in that direction. So blame the BA, blame the, you know, everyone blamed IT because they didn't get what they wanted even though they only asked for it the day before. Things like that, you know, it was kind of, it, it was all over. Um, same organization where I was asked who's to blame when something went wrong, things, and I just stood as a buffer. I, I started in that scenario by just being that buffer in the middle. And because I'm very internally referenced, I don't really care whether higher level management, other people on my level, what they think of me. So um, I basically would, as soon as my boss said who's to blame, I would respond with it doesn't matter. And we're not going to have that conversation, but in a very nice way. Um, and as soon... And I buffered my guys. So my guys got none of that. They got none of the, they didn't even hear any of the blame talk. So that meant that their culture started to change. And we started to talk a lot more about continuous improvement and what can we learn. And so that whole language started to change. But I was also using that with managers higher than me and starting to say, oh, we're going to do this differently and we're going to do that. And we made a mistake there and we failed here. And I started to very deliberately use the word failed a lot and failure in general an experiment um, um i don't know if i just beat them down <laughs> it's but i think the important thing is that it came from below so once they were protected from it and not hearing it all the time they were able to work in a way where they felt safe and they felt protected and that bubbled up and people saw then the results that they were able to get because they weren't afraid and because the blame wasn't there now as i say it wasn't the most extreme it wasn't like a super blame culture um, but, um, yeah, that has turned round. Do some of the business still blame IT for things? Yeah, of course they do. You know? and, uh, and I'm not saying that there's no problems at all, but we're in a very different place than we were. Anyone else? All right, I'll stop punishing you, let you get to lunch now. Thank you.